Welcome to the Blueprint Podcast, where we throw out the old blueprint so you can become who you were always meant to be. I'm your host, Jason Smith, and if you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button and share this podcast with your friends on social media and tag me in it at jbertfit. Today, I have a very special guest for you, Nick Pollard, a world-renowned coach and speaker specializing in people-pleasing, codependency, and addiction. With over 50 million views on social media, Nick has become a leading voice in personal growth and transformation, ranking in the top 10% of coaches globally. Nick's journey began after hitting rock bottom due to an addiction and traumatic childhood. Following his recovery, he founded the People Displeaser Movement, empowering thousands to break free from people-pleasing and reclaim their lives. A successful entrepreneur, Nick's passion lies in helping others have those powerful light bulb moments that spark true change. His philosophy, do the work. It's not glamorous, but it's the path to success. Nick Pollard, welcome to the Blueprint Podcast. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your origin story and how you became the people displeaser. Origin story. That makes me sound so much like a superhero. I don't know what to do with it. You are in a lot of different ways. You're, you're helping so many different people recover from people pleasing. And that's no easy feat. It's something that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of dedication. And that's something that you're bringing to the people that choose to be your clients. So I think that's a really sure. amazing gift that you have. Sure. I, I think on that note, it's just one of, one of my passions for, has always been people. And through my own personal hell of a journey, I started to recognize these patterns that existed in myself around putting others first, which is, it sounds noble. But so often, just like anything else, when you do too much of anything, it becomes either an addictive pattern or it becomes toxic in many ways. So I had spent 30 years of my life trying to live up to my own father, which is so often it's weird because I wanted to be opposite of him, but I wanted to be him. And he was a workaholic and an alcoholic and a variety of other things early in my life, as well as most of my life. And. I'd spent a lot of time from the ages of really what I can remember, which is 13, which by the way, is not great news. Um, <laughs> when you have no memories from zero to 13, that's not positive universally anyway. But so from really about the age of 13 until I was 29, just trying to live up to what did it look like to be like my dad? And that led me down quite a few paths and I did very well as a corporate executive, I, I've had a long and illustrative or successful is probably a better word sales career. And I made plenty of money and I had a small family and life was pretty good. In 2000, some information surfaced about my old man being child molester. So he was a, a pedophile. And when that happened or potentially, I guess it was more of an accusation, but when that happened, all of the memories that I had from the ages of zero to 13 kick, which which is not good news by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. And that continues to happen, by the way, which is really exciting. Through that, I lost my mind, clinically lost my mind. So I was institutionalized and suicidal and homicidal and, and every other suicidal you could come up with. I started to drink pretty heavily at that time. So it was before that I drank pretty normally, but that trauma really triggered in me something that needed to change. So I, I changed it. and. But first I had to go through the throes of not being emotionally aware and being unstable and, and I ended up throwing a lot away. I threw away my family. I, I threw away my career, ended up getting hooked on drugs and alcohol and I was a mess from 2009 until say 2012 ish. I started to write the ship. I met a woman and things got good and I, I got married again and starting to, I started my own business and things were going really well right about. 2016, my father died and he had pretty aggressive type of lymphoma that just took him out quick. Like he was diagnosed in one month, dead the next. And he and I had been estranged for all that time, really some from 09 to 2016. And that's really when things got bad. So that 09 stint was like short. I did a lot of therapy and, and thought I had healed it. But I didn't realize, and I think that I do now, that those deep childhood wounds therapeutically don't really heal themselves. They, they require quite a lot of work. And so in 16, I started drinking again pretty heavily and I was married again, and ended up throwing that marriage away again. And it was 2016, 2017, 
and partly through 2018, I was drinking 30 shots a day plus. And when they finally checked me into a detox, I blew a 0.8 in 2018, which is, that's, I should have been dead, but it, I was on a medical detox for probably six days at that point. And I checked myself into rehab and that was in April of 2018. So that was the first time I'd ever done a rehab stint. And I, I would say that shout out to New Beginnings Recovery Center. They did their very best to save my life and they probably did there in Denver and because I learned a lot, right? I learned a lot about managing pain and I learned a lot about recovery and I, I tried to figure out really who I was. But as most people who struggle with alcohol do, I bounced off the walls of recovery for about two years. First time in, I did about nine months straight and then I met a girl and and she and I were both in treatment and, and the next thing you know, yeah. the, the thing that happens and when you get with somebody who uh, is great at sex because they're toxic and you're really wanting to feel good about yourself. So it's, it's a winning combination for addictive narrative. Just can't stop. Just can't stop. So but then we, she and I bounced off the walls of recovery for quite a while, about a year and a half, two years, we were together, um, went through COVID mostly sober. Sobered up again. Like I said, I went through these periods where I'd go like six to eight months and I'd fall off the wagon and six to eight months and I'd fall off the wagon, sometimes one month. And then in 21, so just post COVID, post lockdowns, we had bought a bus and we had renovated it and it was beautiful and we were going to travel the country and just and dick around and I would work from the road and, and whatever, or we'd go do roofing or whatever, because I'm a roofing sales guy or I was. And in January of 21, we broke up. So there I was with this bus right? and, and she, it, it was a country song. She took my dog and she left my bus in Arizona. I, I had to fly from Baltimore to Las Vegas to go get it. And, but I'm sorry to take it, take an Uber from the Las Vegas international airport to, to Havasu, Arizona, to go pick up this bus. I was fortunate enough to have a friend of mine come with me and pulled into Huntington beach, California, I think on January 11th. Or no, January 9th of 2021. And parked my bus at my friend Joe's house here in Huntington Beach and stayed in his Airbnb while I tried to figure out a place to put that monstrosity. It was a 40 foot bluebird wander lodge. It's not a small, it's just yeah. not a small lot. So I figured out where to put it and then started to recover again on January 11th. Fast forward to recovery is recovery. Every time you do it, you sweat a lot. You feel like a piece of shit and you eat Sour Patch Kids and you go to AA meetings and you know, it's kind of the same deal, just rinse and repeat it for <laughs> all those years. And so I went through that and then I did a good two months of AA. And then in March, I started to notice that the stories in the anonymous rooms were all pretty much the same and that I wasn't really getting much out of it in the way of, in the way of growth. Right. So I started writing these letters to myself and they were like, here's what you're going through and here's how it sucks. Yeah. I can share those with your audience too. If you like, I'll just put them up on a website and let you guys read them. But yeah. through that, I, I started to realize in this catharsis of just tears and <laughs> eating sour fats, kids and working out. That was it. I go get a, I go get a thing of chicken salad from the grocery store and a bag of Sour Patch Kids. And I would go to the gym. I'd go to the gym and I'd go to get, get the chicken salad and the and Sour Patch Kids and buy a bunch of monsters. I'd come home and I'd just do that every day. And then I was getting jacked and it was huge, but... You, you lost me like, at the monsters. <laughs> at like four or five of them. Yeah. And I and by the way, I was drinking so many of them, I would just sleep like a baby. And so there I was, I guess, in quite the middle of the night. I guess it was around seven o'clock on in March, probably around the 4th of March. And... I just, it came to me all at once. Like you've been living your life for everybody else for 40 years. And there I was at 41 years old, 40 years old at the time. I didn't have anything to show for it. I didn't have a life that I liked. And I felt like a miserable piece of shit. And then just to be completely candid, I was ready to just end it. Like I was just done. And it wasn't that I was like suicidal in the way that I was in that kind of sadness. I was just. I just didn't see much point to it anymore, right? Because I'd lived my life in a way that wasn't fulfilling. I lived my life in a way that made people like me, but it, it made me hate me. And so I got online and I Googled what countries are open post COVID. 
Um, and I, because I, it just occurred to me, it's okay, if we're going to be fucking miserable when everybody's going to be mad at us anyway, we may as well do something we like. Yeah, so, may as well be in Costa Rica, right? And it's, incidentally, you say that because Costa Rica was the first country that opened up. And I, I was like, it's the it. influencer's paradise. Right? It sure is. Yeah. Um, so I bought myself a ticket to go to Costa Rica and I thought I'd just be there a couple of weeks. Like I'd just do a little vacation. I'd never traveled the world by myself. Like I'm going to solo travel and I'm going to, I'm going to do some things. I got there and I was in my Airbnb and my now girlfriend had joined me. So it didn't turn out to be a solo trip. Still a lot of fun. And we were both in a toxic spiral, not together, but like getting out of a toxic spiral. And I looked at her one morning and I said, I don't think I want to stop doing this. And she's like, can we afford to keep doing this? And I said, I probably got, if we go month to month and we stay in the same places. Like we, so I figured out the travel hack was like, if we can fly once and be there for three months, then yeah, we can afford to do this because that's the biggest expense of the plane ticket. And she was like, all right, where do we go next? So I got online and I Googled and found out Cancun was open. So we went to Cancun and we were there for, I guess, six or eight weeks. And then came home to California for about three days, picked up some more stuff, put a bunch of our stuff in storage, rearranged our lives, and then fucked back off. And we ended up traveling the world for two and a half years while I just figured out, spent that time to figure out who I was. I think people that experience huge childhood trauma, they don't spend enough time in the aftermath. They're always trying to move on, right? And getting comfortable with that pain and just being sober for that whole year, I you know, traveled the world sober for an entire year, changed the way that I saw life a lot. Because I realized that there were a lot of people that had it a lot worse than me. I realized that despite my dad being that kind of abusive and an alcoholic and a prick and the answer, all that stuff, like he was just another flawed human being. And it wasn't that he didn't love me. It's just that he was very sick. And... It turned out that I was also very sick and I came to the realization along that line that I didn't come from nowhere and neither did he. And that's how I started to down the forgiveness path. More than that, I, I started to forgive myself and started to really ask myself questions. What does it look like if I invent the version of me that I'm proud of? Right. Cause I think there's another kind of component in this that I'm, I'm starting to play with now and in, in terms of like people saying to me, I don't know who I am. And yeah, you do, you, you know, exactly who you are. You just don't like it and you don't like it because you didn't spend the, the time enough to do what healthy people do in childhood, which is invent yourself. You didn't spend enough time in play. You didn't spend enough time learning. You didn't spend enough time doing the things that needed to be done for you to be a happy character. And so it that's how I figured out. Fully self-actualized. I'm a big fan of Avatar, the last airbender. And if there's a moment in there where he, you know, gets electrocuted by a person and it blocks everything. And that's what I think childhood trauma does. It blocks everything. And it's not until you, you take a big hit, like right in the spine, you can come back to life at your core. And I would taken enough big hits. And I think the one that I needed for me was at the time was just to say, screw it. Like I'm going to make everybody mad at me. And I, and it is what it is. I made my kids are mad at me and my mom was mad at me and her parents were mad at her. She ended up getting a divorce. I was, everything was just a mess. It was this beautiful disaster that I was able to orchestrate because I was, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to be me. I'm not going to attach myself to many outcomes. I'm just going to let the chips fall where they may and see where this thing goes. And through that, I was, I guess we've been traveling for three months and I took this coaching course. It was like how to launch your coaching business in three to five days. It turns out all they were going to tell me to do that was useful. was like, make videos, um, right? Make videos. Thanks guys. Just be consistent three times a day. Right. right. Yeah. Make it good. Exactly. I, I do. Yeah. You know, post three times a day. And, we all you know, started in the same voice. spot. Right. Yeah. And there was really no, it's funny. I still use their contract. Their contract was very useful and their sales pitch was very useful. Still use both of them. So that course did probably pay me back in spades, but, but through that, I, I was like, okay, I'll start making videos. And that was actually the hardest thing I ever did. I think starting to make videos was the hardest thing I ever did. Like stepping into the open and saying, I'm going to be a coach and allowing that to be real and letting people make fun of me. And, and I get it all the time. You're just a coach, you're just a coach. You're not a psychologist. No, I'm not. I'm going kind to of want to be. What people don't realize but, is the amount of stretching that occurs when you first decide to do that. So you've been a people pleaser your entire life and you've right. been extremely chronically resilient with going through 
all of these trials and tribulations and starting and going back to where you started again and ending. And it's just constant back and forth. And you finally get to this place where you're stepping back and realizing, and I've never really allowed myself to be fully seen. When you first create those videos, they're awful. They suck. They're oh, absolutely God, they're horrible. So you, you look back on them now. It's like a couple of years ago and it's, am I 16? What is this? Like, why would I make that video like that? And of course I leave it as a reminder for others that it's just like, you eventually grow in your process and you get better at this right. and you get better at public speaking and you become more capable, competent, and confident in who right. you are and how you're showing up. But those early videos, man, it is such a stretch to get there and just to speak your mind and then to like have it make sense at the same time. And everybody is sitting right there watching you, trashing right. you, making fun of you. Who do you think you are? You don't have the credibility for this. Why would you even think that you can do something like this? And you hear Alex Hermosi say this all the time, right? It's like that it's the lonely period. It's the gap between who you are now and who you mm -hmm. really want to be. And you're just not there yet. You haven't met the people that are going to help elevate you to that next level because you're still right. growing in your own process. You get through it, you make it happen, you put the video out and eventually people start to, they notice it. They're like, Hey, that actually makes sense. Sure. So well, what was I, that experience like for you? It was so funny, man. Like I love that period of my videos. Every now and then I go back to them because I started on TikTok and I love to go back and revisit some of those. And I'll probably, now that we're talking about it, I'm going to put them up in my stories this week, just to, just to remind people, like I didn't start out as the people displeaser. I started out as Nick, the men's health coach. And what, what I prefer. That's right. You did dating coaching. Oh yeah. I was a dating yeah. coach for a long time, but my very first video series was called just the tip with coach nick seems appropriate <laughs> right it's just ridiculous and they're so bad and they're filmed poorly and i'm shirtless and i'm walking around in panama <laughs> just absolute nonsense and it took me so and i made three videos a day and they were always under 15 seconds like yeah. i didn't know that's all i knew how to do it's all i could speak and and I was recording in the TikTok app and I'll never forget it. it I, I changed the recording setting to 30 seconds to see if I could get to 30 seconds. And I did this one video and I was heartbroken at the time. It was called uh, real cost of people pleasing. I think it was volume 15. And this was on December 3rd of 21. And I had been making videos three times a day for six months. So we're talking about 90 to a hundred videos, maybe more than that. Yeah. So it was 120. So it was right around 350 or 400 videos that I had put out and I was getting still like nine views. I'd get excited when I got a thousand. Okay. Right? And there I was on December 3rd, I was doing a, a consulting gig in Florida. We had come back to try and make a little money and I was still on COVID unemployment and like, what a disaster. And I posted this video and I forgot about it. I, I legitimately forgot about it. And so I woke up that morning. I didn't check my phone. I went to my consulting gig and so I did my morning meeting and I did all my stuff. And then right around noon, I was like, I should probably check TikTok. See what's going on. Damn thing had 50,000 views. And I thought, holy shit, like this is cool. And then it was like 100,000 views. And then it was 200,000 views. And this was happening like hourly. Yeah. Right. So this thing went to a million and a half views inside of 12 hours. And the people displeaser was born. But so I go from having no followers, like literally 1500 to 15,000 in two days. And then it stopped like full stop. No one was paying attention again. And the people that had seen those videos and liked them were seeing them, of course. Right. And they're like, these are great. And then they, they would share them. And then you do that slow growth over time. But every so often I hit a, a viral one and the algorithm God shine on me and I get a bunch of followers. Oh. And now I have, I am 3000 away from a million across all the platforms. So it's what a meteoric rise to, to fame. Here we go. And always by the one, by the individual person. Right. And people say I'm in a coaching course now that's men's group coaching course. It's, I don't know if Dr. Glover is Dr. Robert Glover. Yeah. I've been no on more the podcast. Guy. Yep. Oh, really? Yeah. He's a friend and, and my mentor. And, yeah. um, he spoke to my men's group. He's a, he's a good friend and he's a mentor. And but I'm in his course and, and one of the things that's fascinating is just like how the, there's a lot of guys that are at that beginning part of the journey, right? They're like, it's, you're so lucky that it worked. And I'm like, mm, not really. I'm really not lucky that it worked. I, I worked my ass off and I cried every night for a week 
in the first week of making content because I'm like, this is so stupid and I feel so dumb. And the eventuality was it just worked. And you probably experienced the same thing. Yeah, it's that interesting. Be, yeah. You put a video out and you cross your fingers. You don't know what's going to hit. You don't, you really don't, especially on TikTok. And even just right. a couple of years ago, you had no idea what was going to hit. It was so random. And then I fell into take a walk with me and that just became my tagline. So that became yeah. my videos. That's what I create. And TikTok dictated how that ended up happening. And so I stick right. with it now and it seems to work. And then we throw a bunch of memes in there as well. And those always hit. Sure. <laughs> yeah, those always yeah. do well. I haven't done the meme stuff quite as much yet. I, I feel like that's probably next on my list. But it's been a it's been a fun ride, um, and I've I've got a book coming out now, so it's due to it's due to the publisher. God willing, I get a deal this week, but it's slated for July of twenty five to be delivered, which would put us into twenty six for print and delivery. So the hope is that we can, depending on what the on the publisher's feelings on this, like how do I get this to the masses by kind of late 2025, maybe first of, or very late 2025 to hit that kind of crowd of how do I improve my life and talk to my writer. So I have a a ghost writer that I'm working with as a collaborator because I don't know how to write a book and and I didn't want to learn at real slowly. So I figured out I'd just hire somebody to help me do that. And everybody does it. Right. And I was talking to him and said, I think what I want this to be is very much what you just said. It's an origin story. I want this to start from the 09 pain. And there will be stories in between that are profoundly painful, but very useful. And then I think there's also some hilarious shit that goes on in that timeline. The first time I ever went to a swingers club and the time I shit myself in a bar and there's all these kind of awful things that I did to myself that are comical in a lot of ways, but I think will be really cool. And it's just proof that where you came from and your past experiences don't have to determine your future. Don't stay locked no. into a past moment or a previous version of you. You're meant to be here and to grow beyond the suffering, to transmute all of that energy into love and to become the best version of yourself that you can possibly be. And that means sure. allowing yourself to become who you're capable of becoming. And I think right. that's Whether the, like the biggest not, struggle. Yeah. Exactly. I think you're right in that. One of the things I work with a lot of guys on is, this, is the value of honesty. And I think that with yourself, nice, yeah. yeah, with yourself, nice guys are liars, every single one of them. And as are people pleasers, and that's going to make me unpopular again, but I, fuck you if you can't take a joke, but the, it goes back to get the book, no more Mr. Nice guy by Dr. Robert Glover. You'll hear all about covert contracts and you'll begin to understand some of the behaviors that you exhibit that turn people away from you and leave you feeling isolated and alone. Right. That's, and you, if you look at what a people pleaser does, they, they engage in this kind of a toxic hope that people around them will, they just hope that people will help meet, meet their needs or fulfill their, they just hope that the person that they love will change, or they just hope it's always this hopefulness. And I think that also leads to what I call the narcissistic step ladder, where you meet somebody and they're really nice to you and then they treat you like shit a little bit, right? But rather than apologizing and correcting course back to where they were, they apologize kind of and correct course to slightly lower than where they were. And a people pleaser loves that shit, right? But as as long as you keep going down that ladder, you're experiencing that kind of, well, they're changing a little, they're getting a little better, right? But they don't ever actually get better. And I think that's why so many of the people I work with end up in relationships with these highly toxic people. And whether it's women or men, I work with both. I'm oddly shifting toward women right now, which is... Well, I like that, but it really just, there's some variance in the system that I think not every disorder is a disorder. I, I think Jung said it best that neurotic behaviors are almost always a substitute for legitimate suffering. What are you avoiding? That's usually the question I ask people. What are you avoiding? Because it's so much more powerful than what do you need to do? So what are you avoiding doing? If you can figure that out, life gets pretty simple. One of the big questions that people often hit me with is how to actually identify what my boundaries are, but then also set and maintain them with other people in a way that doesn't push people away. So Bulletproof Boundaries, the free guide I offer does touch on this, but it's being revamped presently because I, I want to change it. But the first thing most people don't understand is that boundaries aren't set with other people. Your boundaries are set within you. And until you understand that component, 
all of the, and because of that, what happens is that they go out and they have all these awkward boundary conversations and it pisses everybody off and nobody will hang out with them anymore. And, and I think that all is, um, I think the problem that comes from that, of course, is you're not actually impacting how you show up in the world, right? So one of the things I highlight in Bulletproof Boundaries is that your boundaries are about you. They are the line that delineates the, it, it, it's the line that delineates where the world starts and the you end and therefore where the world ends and you begin. And your boundaries really are only to define kind of four things with other people. Who do you allow in your life? How long do they get to be there? What do they get to do while they're there? And when do they have to leave? And that's it. And when you put that in context, it's more about how you react or how you act in the presence of things that, that you feel are toxic and are you willing to adhere to your own values and principles? One of mine, for instance, I, I value my time very highly and I value my time with family. Very so Sundays I am unavailable for anything. I don't care if it's your birthday. So if somebody calls me and says, Hey, do you want to come out on my birthday? I just say simply, I cannot, I, I spend time with my family on Sunday. That's a boundary. That's all that is. I spend time with my family on Sundays, therefore I don't do anything on Sunday. Oh, okay. Most people are good with that. Right. But if somebody asks me why I'll say, I'm an adult. I don't answer why questions. This is how this works. Right. So I'm very assertive in that way. And I, I think where boundaries are concerned, that's the biggest misconception is that you, that you have to set them with other people or that you can set them with other people. They're not a rule book. It's not, it's like, it's not like you don't get to smoke cigarettes because that's against my boundaries. No. That's not how that works, right? If your boundary sounds like you're telling other people how to live their lives, then it's not a boundary right. and it's going to piss off everyone in your life. And, and it's, universe. An it's an area of opportunity for that individual that's trying to fix and change other people just so you can like them. It's recognizing right. that it's actually a behavior you don't like. It's not something that you want to have in your life. And it's right. actually recognizing something about your values and what type of experience you really want to have. And so you're not giving yourself right. the experience you want to have, but you're too afraid to let that relationship go or to even say, look, I don't, I love you. I appreciate you. I love spending time with you. However, I don't appreciate this part of this and, and then try right. to find some compromise in there, but then understand that it may come down to, you got to go and part ways. Right. So the parting ways as a boundary, I think is also one of the one of the bigger misconceptions that people that are playing out right now is this whole let's go no contact with our mother or whatever because yeah. my mom didn't respect my boundaries number one you probably set a rule for your mother and you're that's never going to work and then number two so you didn't do your boundaries and then secondarily why don't you just turn the volume down a little bit there's not everything has to be yes or no especially in our relationships so one of the things I teach in the Boundary Bootcamp is this idea that your relationships are on a dial. And if they're too loud, turn it down. So if somebody's expressing a particular behavior, let's say they drink too much when you hang out and you don't like being around them, simply just say that. I had a friend years ago, this is where I started to learn about boundaries, I think on accident, where he had invited me to go out for drinks um, with him. And this was probably... 2013 in and I had gone out the night before. So I was still a little bit on the loaded side when he showed up and then we got to the bar and I was being party boy, right? Like I was, I was having too, way too much fun on a Sunday morning and we hung out and he left a little earlier than I thought. And I thought that was a little strange. And then he didn't talk to me for three weeks, but he called me three weeks later and he goes, Hey, can I talk to you about something? I'm sure. What is it, man? He was, he was like my best friend. Like when we hung out last, you were really drunk. And it was really not fun for me. And if we're going to hang out and I do love hanging out, I'd appreciate it if maybe you didn't get wasted the night before so we can actually enjoy our time together. And I was like, wow. And he goes, and if you're going to drink like that night before, just tell me and we'll hang out another time. Oh, that, that was like, that is what a boundary sounds like. Yeah. Great. And I said, Dave, I'm really sorry. And. He was like, it's okay. I just wanted to, I wanted to tell you and we're good. And I was like, do you want to come down tonight and grab a beer? And he's like, sure. And we did. And we had a great time. And through that, I realized what friendship looks like. And that's part of where I come up with this kind of dial situation. Express your needs to other people 
they're not going to know otherwise. And when you realize that healthy people ask for what they want and healthy people have boundaries, then it's, it's not that you're a jerk. It's that you're becoming actualized. So you're telling me other people can't read minds. No, no, that's, that's exactly right. The things that most people I've, I've been doing don't. it all wrong this entire time. Right. <laughs> you're supposed <laughs> to know what I want and need. That's the classic nice guy situation too, right? Where, yeah, we expect the world to intuit our desires and, and to make that happen for us. Just absolute horseshit. It's a terrible way to treat people. And you know, I'm really glad that I've, I've been able to find, I actually didn't find Dr. Glover until last year. Most of this, I just done raw dogging it through life. <laughs> I found my way. Uh, it's always interesting. You always find the information when you need it, when you're ready to receive it, when you're ready to start taking sure. a look at it. And even at first you might get the book, thumb through it, say, ah, that's not for me. Put it on a shelf. And then a year later, sure. you pick it back up because now you're ready. It's been sitting there. It's there. And you feel drawn to it and you dive in and you start sure. self-educating, which is something I'm huge on to dive into self-education and to acknowledge and recognize that it's your job to take care of you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and to grow, develop, and evolve at your own rate. And that includes right. diving in and finding the books and podcasts and coaches and other people that can help you out in the real world to right. develop yourself further, but then to actually put that stuff into action, not just have all the knowledge, but then to deploy it in real time in your life. And, and that's what makes right. all the difference. And those are all the things that you've done. It's, you're right. It's a lot of the work that I've had to do on myself has been just figuring it out on my own. And then as you start to hunt for resources, you find different ways of connecting and enjoying people. And then through that, you learn and grow and they recommend things. And then you recommend things. That's how life progresses. And I, I think a lot of people right now are stuck in the idea that life is not fun and it is, and it's only fun when you realize it's not supposed to be fun. Scott Peck says mm -hmm. that and the road less traveled, life is hard. And until you realize life is hard, it's always going to feel hard. So how do we push through that suffering that seems to be innate that's pre-wired into us? If you look at the cause of suffering, I think probably the main cause of suffering is outcome-based thinking. So. I have a potential client, big client that I'm trying to get right now. And I'm still a people pleaser and I'm still a nice guy. So that's a recovery process that goes on for a lifetime. And he, he had to reschedule today and having that, oh no, I'm not good enough moment. <laughs> You're going to leave me. This isn't going to work. You're not going to be my friend anymore. And there is that fear of rejection that, that yeah. you go through. And so I sat with myself. Right after the text came through, before I did what I normally do, which is like freak out and send a bunch of text messages. And I just put my feet on the ground and asked myself, as I ground myself, put my feet down, be where my feet are and ask myself, what is the outcome I'm attached to that's causing this level of suffering and whether it was money or prestige or whatever. And I came up with an answer and I'm like, okay, so what would it look like if I was just curious about that to let that pass? I did. And that is usually how I do it. It's just. As soon as I feel that suffering come on me, I'm like, okay, that's usually outcome-based thinking. What am I focusing on? That's not real, right? I have done the best work that I can do. And that's why I keep attracting good clients. And the result of that is that I get to be me. And if this is not my client, then it's not my client. And that's okay. So to answer your question, like, how do we power through the suffering or how do we get through the suffering? You don't, you experience it and you learn to love it a little bit where you say, okay, I see you. I see you. What are you? I'm very curious. Very often if I'm suffering, it's because my inner child wants something and I'm not giving it away, which is another outcome-based thing. You know, I'm trying too hard to delay my gratification, right? Because I've listened to a Jocko Willink podcast or something. I'm like, I have to be disciplined or I'm a piece of shit, right? <laughs> no, but I, I love what you did. So you're identifying your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. You're acknowledging what you're going through, what you're feeling how that feels in the body. So now we're going to dive into some self-soothing techniques and that can look like mm -hmm. grounding yourself, putting your feet on the floor, lying on the floor. Once again, with your feet on the floor, your knees bent up, take that deep nasal inhale in and let that long exhale out through the mouth. But it can also look like getting up and going for a walk, getting outside, getting that sure. vitamin D or sitting down with a journal and a pen and really start writing this stuff out and figure out like why, what is happening right now? And what words would I associate with what I'm experiencing? And so you get, you gain all of this clarity and then you can remind yourself that, you know what, I'm actually, I'm safe and, and right. I'm doing okay. And everything's actually fine. 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose the client. This isn't the end of the world. Right. And even if I did more clients are going to come in at right. some point down the road, cause they're going to resonate with my message and my energy and who right. I am as a person. So actually everything's okay. Cool. So I'm doing something really scary. So I go to, I'm going on vacation on Thursday and I'm going to be gone until the 28th and I have made a decision. There's only one client that needs to talk to me while I'm on the road and he's just in crisis. So I've, I've made the exception and I've moved his schedule to where it like matches with something I can tolerate. It's once a week, but I've scheduled out two weeks of rerun content in my channels and I am freaking the fuck out. Why is, <laughs> why is that? Because I'm like, if I don't put out new content, I'm not going to get any more clients. I won't get any more clients. I'm going to die old, alone, a broken hole. So it, it's that, but there it is, that outcome-based thinking, right? It's, if I do this, then this. And I can't predict that. I can, this is a really interesting rumination thought is that most people have that ruminating brain ruminate on negativity where I can't predict the outcome if I make content every day. Let alone can I predict the outcome if I don't. Right now, the outcomes are, they're easier to predict. I've never scheduled that rerun content. And will I make content while I'm on vacation? Sure, but I'm not going to make that my focus. I'm going to make the enjoyment of my girlfriend. I'm going to make the enjoyment of the time. She's turning 30 and it's a big deal. And we're going for a cool vacation. And that should be all that's for. And I've earned that. But so you, so you can be these. present. So I can just be there and, yeah. and enjoy her and enjoy the time. So. It's interesting though, that when I get in that kind of fear headspace, all the things I can convince myself that are wrong with me or that are wrong with what I'm doing. And so often there's nothing wrong with what you're doing. I think another kind of victimized mindset in the world today is that something's got to be wrong with you. You, you don't have to be miserable to want better for yourself. And that's all I'm trying to accomplish in this life. I love my life. My life's really good, but how do I want better? And and then people are like, aren't you being greedy or being selfish? Yeah, sure. Selfishness is great. I'm yeah, I, I, I would ask know. them to define what exactly is greedy here? What exactly is being selfish? What does that look like? Me taking care of me physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? Me living my life and enjoying the people that are in my life that I've invited in and having right. those experiences? Is that selfish? Really? M making money? And having money in the bank and paying my bills, it, it, that's selfish? Right. I don't, I don't know that right. it is, but I can relieve some of your fears around the repurposing of content. You just have to remember that you're always meeting people where they are. And right. the, the algorithm eventually does stop pushing out certain content. Now, right now, Facebook is dipping into 2023 and pushing out some of my older stuff. And so I had that is thought. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And... <laughs> And I'm cracking up because I'm like, what is happening? I used to have a reach of like 1.7 million consistently on Facebook. And then it got tanked over the past six months down to 68,000. So that's Same. a big, that's a big jump, right? And it's what's happening, what's going on with, and so you try to figure out what's happening with the algorithm. And of course you get them on the phone and they're just like, oh no, everything's fine, man. You're good. Really? Because <laughs> my reach dropped considerably and it doesn't make any sense, but now it's like back right. on an upward turn, which is, that's fine. I'm happy with it. But I started thinking, if you take that old content and you start pushing that out, yeah, it's me at the beginning of my process of developing content, but somebody, you know, just turned 25, 30 years old and they've never come across this type of content before. They're going to see that. Right. They're going to find it relatable. And then they get to take the deep dive into all the new things that you've created and developed. And sure. it starts, the wheels start spinning. Oh, if he can do that and get there, then I, right. can, I can probably do the same thing in my own way, in sure. my own circumstances. Relax, have yeah, fun, enjoy your vacation. It's going to be a good time. And I've got really great clients and every one of them just have fun with the time and I'll text you if you need me, and like all those things. So that's the other thing I think. I think the thing I learned the most, and I hate the word gratitude because it's so used, it's used really poorly. I'm going to sit and write in the gratitude journal. Okay. It's okay to be grateful for the things that are in your life. But when you turn that gratitude toward yourself, that's where it becomes really impactful. I'm grateful that I have a work ethic. I'm grateful that I worry about out, right? I'm grateful that I get, that I have these fears. Because some of these fears are driving forces in how successful I've become. And 
Alex Ramosi talks about this. If you're miserable, it's probably because you're not chasing big enough dragons. You're not fighting enough beasts to, to have enough purpose. And I have some big beasts that I want to fight this next year. And as I'm drawing to the fourth quarter here of, of 24, this is usually my big push. This is usually where I make 90% of my income for some reason or another. And I think probably Christmas and boundaries. That's the same. That's um, but yeah, I think there's, I think there's joy in the pain. I've never said it like that. I really do think there's joy in the pain. I've had a very painful life. Uh, I didn't come from nowhere. I was hurt pretty bad from the ages of three to nine, repeatedly hundreds of times. And I've been bullied. I've been in narcissistic relationships. I've been beaten unconscious. I've, I've had some really awful things that have happened to me. So what, who do you get to be as a result of that? I, I think that I'm very lucky to have had to build my own empire. I'm very lucky to have had to learn to love myself. Very lucky. Um, and I'm very grateful to myself for sticking it out all, all these years. Love that. Your mess becomes your message is something that you hear people like Dean Graciosi say all the time. Sure. I feel like you've truly embodied that again through doing the work on yourself physically mentally emotionally spiritually and then recognizing that it's a lifetime of work it, that it's ongoing that it continues on forever as some of these things begin to hit us at different points in time you think you healed something and then 10 years later you're like ah here it is again and instead right. of seeing it as this potential threat to your current experience you're able to zoom out step back allow yourself to become the observer and recognize that I've actually already dealt with this. So you spend t less and less time looking at that particular incident. You yeah. finally allow yourself to move beyond that. It's such a difficult thing to do. What a amazing life that you have lived to be able to then turn all of that around and then be willing to help other people through their own process. That's extremely difficult because like you said, you've got that client that's currently in crisis mode. You know, you're still taking that on as well through your own process. I think that's the beauty of it. I, I think that's, I think people don't, especially coaches, I don't know if they give their clients enough credit. I couldn't be who I am without my clients. The way that I learned from those people, I've not once in my entire career as a coach, spent 15 years on and off, had one friend come to me for coaching, but every single one of my coaching clients is my friend. I have people all over the world. I, and I know that if I was to pick up the phone and call any one of those men or any one of those women, say, I need help, I'd get it. And that is what humans are. Humans are loving. And I've said this for a long time, that humans are good. We're born good. And as we turn into people, that's when we get twisted. There's never been a documented case of a baby that was born a racist, right? There's never been a documented case of a baby that was born sexist or misogynist or put an ist anywhere in there. There's never been a documented case. Why is that? Because humans are born a clean slate and we're born good. So if our default is good, if what's within us is always good, then how do we just encourage that to become more relevant? And I think that's, I think that is the iteration of my message that's coming is that if you can accept that internally you're actually good then you just have to invent the person that you want to be. It's not about self-discovery anymore. It's not about finding myself. Where'd you go? You didn't get fucking lost right there. It's about how do I invent the version of me that is good for me? And I hope that's, I hope that's what my book does. I hope that's, I hope that when the book of Nick is closed and I move on to whatever's next, that the message that stays on the planet is that people are good. Human. Love it. Nick Pollard, thank you for being on the Blueprint Podcast. Tell everybody how to reach you and work with you. The best place you can find me is at nickpollard.com. Bought the website. So much easier that way. Or you can reach me at The People Displeaser on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. I, I managed to get the brand for myself. I am launching, a, a since you're doing this you know, relatively soon, I am launching my Boundary Bootcamp will be coming out again in October. So the people displeaser.com is where we have that. And I highly encourage you if you're struggling with boundary work and don't know how to do that, hop in there because it's a great community. We have awesome people in there. Got a really great uh, community manager that's just super powerful. 
He's been with me now a year and a half. He's done the battery boot camp like five times. He just loves it. Hop in there and hopefully we'll meet you there. Awesome. Nick, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me.